I'm going to have fun as a pastor this morning. Turn to the book of Habakkuk. Yeah, that's what I thought. What's that? Turn to the book of Habakkuk. Let's see who gets there first. Habakkuk. We're going to start in chapter 1. This is one of those books that uh, you don't hear preached out of a lot. As a matter of fact, you don't hear a lot of sermons out of the minor prophets. Habakkuk is one of 12 minor prophets. And when we say minor prophets, we're not talking like they're on the JV team and the other guys are the varsity. Uh, when it says um, minor prophets, what it means is the brevity of the book and the focus of the book. You have the major prophets, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Those are very big books that speak on a big picture term. And then you have 12 minor prophets, like Jonah, Hosea. Very small, very concise uh, message. And Habakkuk is a contemporary of Jeremiah. I'm going to give you a little history to give you the context. So I, I don't want to bore you, but I want to get you on the same page because I believe this book talks to us today. Chapter, chapter 1. There's only three chapters in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, we're going to go through this uh, a little bit over the summer. It won't take us long. But um, Israel, uh, let's, we've got time. I'll give you an uh, overview real quick. God finds a man who's an idol worshiper and a liar. And he says, I'm going to use this man. And he calls this man and says, I want you to leave your land, leave your family, and go to a place that I'm going to show you. And over time, this man learns to trust in God. It isn't until much later in his life that his faith declares him righteous. And that man's name is Abraham. Now, Abraham throughout his life has trouble lying. He will pass it on to his children. His children will have the same problem. He, he struggles with trusting God, but by the end of his life, he trusts God so much, he's willing to sacrifice his own son. When I first read that as a new Christian, I said, why would God ever ask something so horrible? And it wasn't that God was asking so, something so horrible. He was revealing something that was going to happen thousands of years later. Because on that same mountain where Abraham takes his son, God's going to take his son, Jesus, to be sacrificed, except he's not going to stop it. It's going to happen, and that sacrifice will be for all of us. In the context of that relationship, God makes a promise to Abraham and his wife, who are unable to have children, and he says, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. And Abraham kind of said, well, how are you going to do that? I don't even have any children. And God says, I'm going to give you a child. Sarah is going to give birth to a child. Well, Abraham's much like we are. They got tired of waiting on God and said, God must have meant to do it this way. And they take matters into their own hands. They have a son named Ishmael through another woman. But God says, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a child of promise. Out of that child will come a tribe, 12 tribes, and these 12 tribes will form the nation of Israel. We're flying through the Bible very quickly. Those 12, the 10 tribes and the two are going to have a split. Now let me tell you how this happens. There was a number of sons, not to Abraham, but to his descendants. And there was 12. You had Asher, Dan, Ephraim, Gad, Issachar, Manasseh, Naphtali, Reuben, Simeon, Zebulun, Judah, and Benjamin. And they were all one family, and God says, I'm going to make you a nation. God told them how I want to rule this nation, and, and the nation said, we don't want to do it your way, God. We want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And so God says, I will give you what you want, which is often a judgment of God. God often judges us by giving us the very thing we want. I remember I shared this with some of y'all, but there's a lot of visitors here. I remember watching Columbo. He was always smoking that cigar. And I said, I want to smoke a cigar like Columbo. I don't know why I didn't want a sucker like Kojak. I wanted a cigar. <laughs> and so my dad 
got tired of me asking, and my dad said this in his head, you know what? I'm going to give the boy what he wants. He was shocked because I knocked the first cigar out with no problem. So he said, you know what, son? Let me give you another one. He gave me the second one. And something happened a quarter way through that second one. I turned green. I got nauseous sick. I wanted to die. My father gave me what I wanted to teach me. That's not what I really needed. God says, give them their king. They don't want to do it my way. We'll do it their way. However, remember that when I give you this, all these things are going to happen. They didn't care, so give us a king. The first king, let's see who knows who the first king of Israel was. Who was he? Saul. And he was a tall man. He looked the part. And, and God loved him, and he called him to be king. But Saul's heart wasn't with the Lord. Saul really worried about what everybody else thought. He tried to please men more than God. He was very selfish as, as his kingdom. And he's referred to as the king that God had none of his heart. It ends up costing him the kingdom, his life, and his children's life. God, during that reign, says, I have found another man I will appoint as king. He's a man after my own heart. That's King, king David. And he rules and he teaches us through the Psalms and through the books how it is to worship God and to pray to God and to seek God. And David's not perfect. He messes up. But boy, he has a heart for God. As David's getting ready to die, there's a power struggle within that family who's going to be the next king. And there's one that has kind of self-appointed himself. And they know that Solomon is the man and Solomon is the next king. So we said Saul had, God had none of Saul's heart. He had all of David's heart. But Solomon had a little problem. Does anybody remember what Solomon's problem was? Women. women. He liked the women. Hundreds and hundreds of wives and concubines. I'm doing good to handle one. I don't know how in the world he did what he did. Uh, but God imparted great wisdom onto him. He asked for wisdom and God granted it to him. It was the, the highest that Israel ever got. But when he died, his son was a little stubborn little unteachable, wouldn't listen to the elders. And he kind of said, I'll tell you what the deal is. And they said, oh, really? And there was a split in the kingdom. <coughs> Rehoboam has this part, and Jeroboam has this part, and you get a split. And they call it the northern and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom now will be referred to as Israel. The southern kingdom is going to be referred to as Judah. Judah is made up of Benjamin and Judah, and the other ten tribes are the northern. Now what begins to happen is you have different kings. And let me tell you something. If you want to do an interesting study, study judges and kings, and you will see what is happening in America. What was happening in both of these kingdoms was you'd have a good king and then a bad king. Now what I mean by that is this. A king that sought God and a king that wanted nothing to do with God. A king that sought God and a king that didn't want anything to do with God. And over time, the kings that didn't want anything to do with God kept the power and the nation fell. The northern kingdom is the first one to fall. Assyria has taken them over. Judah is struggling. And Judah has a wonderful king who started his kingdom reign at the age of eight. God just had his hands on this young boy, and he had a heart for God. And he said, you know, we need to rebuild the temple. The temple is in disre disrepair. And as they're building that, rebuilding the temple and fixing it back up, they come across the word of God that has been lost. This king begins to read God's word and says, you know what? We need to do what this book says. And they began to live by faith, and the kingdom begins. There's hope, and it starts to turn things around. He starts to destroy all the idol worship in the land. He's, he's restoring the worship back to biblical worship. And there's a revival that begins to take place. But as that king dies, his sons follow. And every king after him becomes more and more corrupt. When the leadership gets corrupt, the nation begins to fall. Because so as the leader goes, so goes the nation at times. Doesn't have to be that way, but that's the way it is very often. 
This book we know was written sometime between the fall of Nineveh, 612 B.C., and the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. And the great thing about this book is all the other books, most of them are the story about the prophet, God giving the prophet a message, and the prophet going and giving the message. This is not that book. This book is this. The prophet struggling with God and talking to God and God talking back to him. It is a struggle that they're having. And there's some great lessons in this book. There's some things that this book has taught me that I had when I was growing up as a Christian that I realized, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't know that. And it's because it's hidden. That's why I was laughing and watching y'all look. It's kind of hidden in here. If you were to take this book and just break it down, you could break it down a lot of ways. You could break it down by the struggle Habakkuk is having. Chapter 1, he's wondering and asking questions. Chapter 2, he's waiting on God and God's answering him. And the last one, chapter 3, he's worshiping. If you just take the positions where Habakkuk is, he starts in the valley, he ends in the, he, in chapter 2, he's in the watchtower, and in chapter 3, he's ascending to the mountains. You could break it down this way. He starts off in turmoil. Chapter 2, he goes to trust. And chapter 3 enters into triumph. This book is quoted in Acts 13, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, and very few people even know it's in the Bible. And it is a powerful, powerful book. And so if you will, if you will bow with me, and then we will start, we'll read and, and discuss this book and hopefully learn something today. Let me, um, let's just pray and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would show yourself strong through your word and the power of your word. There are some people in this church right now that are struggling. They are hurting. They have the question that they even addressed at camp, God, why? And Father, I pray that you would not only give them some encouragement through this word, but that you would give them how to react, how to handle it and navigate it. I pray that you would be bigger in our eyes, Father. I pray that you would help those that are trying to know you, to see you in a great way. And Father, I just pray that you take what I have struggled with and studied and that you bless it because your word is very clear. Apart from you, I can do nothing. So I pray that you would show yourself strong on behalf of your church and your people and your pastor, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's start at chapter 1, starting at verse 1. My Bible has the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. Some will have the oracle which the prophet Habakkuk saw. I want you to notice it's something that he is seeing. It says the prophet's question. Verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless the justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, per perverse judgment proceeds. I don't know if you've ever had something horrific happen to you, a tragedy happen to you, or a problem that hits you, that, that just, befell, just fell down on you, so to speak, and you didn't even see it coming. Or something happened where there was a wickedness where you, if you're honest, said, God, why? Why did you let this happen? Why did you do this to me? This is how this book starts. And the great thing about this book is it's going to reveal that our ability to trust God is tested when we see what is going on around us and it doesn't make sense. 
Somewhere along my Christian journey, someone told me, you are not allowed to question God. You accept it and you walk by faith. And as I began to study my Bible, that is not what the men of God do. Matter of fact, just think of this for a second. This is what Habakkuk's question is. You ready? Think of it. And the way it's written, he's not being courteous and he's not being respectful. He is hurting and he's in pain and he's crying out is the way the Hebrew construction is. And this is what he says. How long shall I cry and you will not hear? See, we kind of read it this way. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry? And you, that's not how he's saying it. He's saying it this way. How long shall I cry and you not hear me? Now, some of us, when we hear that, go, you should never, ever talk to God that way. And we're going to explain that a little bit later. But that is how he's starting this book. Why? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? Why? Is that being real honest? That's being real honest. And he goes on and logs this. The psalmist does this in, 70, in Psalm 73. This is one of my favorite psalms that, that really resonated with me while I was in seminary. The psalmist says this, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled and my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, and their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers their garments. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lawfully. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. And that psalmist goes on to read and, and will write out how he sees all this and he goes, here it is, ready? God, what? Why? How come I'm doing everything right and being honest and trying to be a man of integrity and it's almost like two steps forward, four steps back and this lion cheating, scheming dog who's knocking people off is advancing 20 feet at a time. I don't get it. Why? The rest of that psalm is interesting. He says, but then I went into your house of worship and I realized what their end will be. Because God says, I am not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. But Habakkuk's looking at all this and we do the same thing. When we see these things, we too struggle. It leaves us with questions. Why did this happen? How long until this is over? God, where are you? God, why? And Habakkuk is bothered by what God isn't doing. He can see plainly what needs to be done, and God isn't doing anything. Have you ever been there? Which have you ever been there? I've been there. I've been like, God, what? Here's one. You want to know what me and my wife struggle with? How come the drug user up here at the hotel can have six kids and we can have none? Answer that. God, why? They don't even want their kids. They're selling their kids. We just want one. Can you just give us one? No. God, say it with me, church. God, they just got off of drugs. They're keening their life up. They've got a job. They're making advancements. We've been struggling for 20 years. And they're going to die in a car accident? God, why? It doesn't make sense. That's where Habakkuk is. And we're left asking, if God is good, this is really what we struggle with. Those that are, let me rephrase that. The ones that are thinking struggle with this. If God is good, and this has happened, apparently he doesn't have the power to stop it. Or, if he has the power to stop it and he didn't, then he must not be what? God. Yeah, he can't be good. He can't be God. That's what the atheist says. If God is all-powerful, say amen if he's all-powerful. Do you really believe he's all-powerful? Yeah, we do. He is all-powerful. 
If God is all powerful, is he all good? Amen. I remember that's the first thing I learned praying. God is great. God is. If he's all powerful and he's all good, then why? That's where Habakkuk's at. That's where a lot of people struggle with in the world. And some of us were taught never to question God or struggle with that at all. You don't question it. You just what? Habakkuk's not that man. Jeremiah's not that man. King David is not that man. They're not that man. They're going to question God. Some of us have total confidence in our wisdom and understanding, and so it gives us the impression we know better than God. So this is what we can learn from this prophet. I want you to, to write this down because some of us need to hear this. Number one, God is big enough to handle our wrestlings. God is big enough to handle our wrestling. During my fo time following Jesus, there have been numerous hard times in my life. Some of them have been caused by others, whether for selfish reasons or just meanness or spiteness. Some of my hard times have been caused by others. Some of my hard times have been caused by circumstances out of my control. But a lot of my hard times, most of my hard times have been caused by who? Me. Habakkuk's in this place where the circumstances, he's not causing it. It's something outside of him, and he's asking God why. And when those times come, I felt, I don't know if you've ever felt this, that God is not there, that God is being silent, that God is not listening to me, and he's not answering. That's where Habakkuk is. You ever felt like God's abandoned you? Let's, let's be real honest in church today. Raise your, be honest. No one's going to think you're a person of no faith. Matter of fact, the Bible says you're probably a person of more faith than you realize. How many of you have ever felt like God just abandoned you? He's been silent. Raise your hand. Look at that. This is a real thing. And Habakkuk cries out, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear? In verse 12, he's going to say this. Are you in, in, in verse 12, we'll look at this next week. He almost is accusing God. Are you not from the everlasting? Are you not God? But he finishes the rest of that sentence with, Oh my God and my Holy One. Habakkuk is challenging and asking questions and struggling to understand. But it never enters his mind to stop following God, trusting God, or leaving God. Never. I had a young man in my house. I didn't ask permission. He's here today. I hope he will forgive me. I had a young man come to my house years and years and years ago, and he was struggling with a storm in his life. And he came to me, and he knew I had the information he wanted. And he says, can you tell me? I need to know because he felt if I could get this information, it will bring me some closure. It will help me to know what is right and what is wrong. Can you just tell me? And this was back when I had my weight set up in the garage. I said, come here. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. If you can lift this weight, I'll tell you. And he went and, and, and tried to lift that weight, and he couldn't lift the weight. I said, son, just like you're not ready to lift that, you're not ready for this yet. Come back to me when you're 21. Now, did I want to tell him? Yeah. Did he need to know? Was he ready for it? Sometimes, and we're going to see this next week, God goes, you won't even believe it if I tell you. You want to know why you're not going to have kids, Larry? Because I got a plan. Not like anything you ever need, ever seen. I want to bring you some kids, and you're going to have to go through a lot for about two years. <coughs> but I'm going to give you, not for your sake, but for them. That's what I thought. And then every time you go, no, God didn't bring them there for them. They brought them there for God is perfect in his wisdom. The problem is we can't handle the truth sometimes. Amen or oh me? We can't. And so sometimes God's silence isn't because he doesn't want to tell us or because he's trying to keep us in the dark. It's because if he told us, we couldn't handle it. That young man came to me later when he was older and said, can you tell me? I said, I will tell you. And he was ready. We were able to sit and talk about that. Habakkuk is calling out to God. 
and God's going to answer next week. And you can read, you can cheat and look in chapter 2. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, he says, really God's saying, I can handle anything you throw at me, Habakkuk. The question is, can you handle what I'm going to tell you? Matter of fact, when God gives him the answer, Habakkuk throws him a little fit. What? Are you serious? Or as John Hardy would say, really? Really? We'll see that next week. The thing I want us to learn here is Habakkuk is totally honest and frank with God. But he also will never leave him. John chapter 2 says this. They went out from us. He's talking about the church. People going out from the church. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that none of them were with us. Listen, God does not chide him for being honest in his doubts. Matter of fact, God comes to us and says, bring your questions to me. I am big enough to handle your questions. Habakkuk has a relationship with God that's so intimate that he can get angry and go, why? But his heart loves God so much he knows God's going to answer him. There's some people that get angry at God and go, why, and shake their fist and walk away. God's word says they were never really part of the family to begin with. Let me ask you a question. Is it healthier for my wife to keep everything bottled up inside of her because she doesn't want to be honest with me? She just keeps it all to herself. Is that healthy? No. That's not healthy in a relationship. That's that's fear-driven. It's called tyranny. Now, it works really well for me, works really poorly for her. Can you imagine if you had to live a life where you have bothers and resentments and concerns and you have to be quiet because I say so? Is that a relationship? That's more of a business contract. Does God want us operating that way? No. When we don't understand something, he wants us to come to him because he's big enough and to wrestle with him and go, God, why did you give me cancer? God, why is my back the way it is? Now, here's the thing. If you come to God honestly in relationship, he will give you an answer. And it may not be what you want to hear, but it will be the truth. And sometimes he waits for us to hear the answer. It took God two or three years in my life to tell me why my back was bad. I was angry. I really was angry. I did a lot of stuff all by my... I didn't need anybody. I can't do that anymore. Hey, Michelle, can you come help me? Hey, Camden, can you help me move this? Hey, Ronnie, can you help me to do this? God was trying to show me something in my life. And the truth was wonderful. We'll look at that next week. God reveals, God invites us to pour our hearts to him so that we can trust him in every area of our life. There are ones like Habakkuk that ask God because they love him so much and they want to know why. And they press into God. They, they seek God, they knock, and God opens the door. They ask, seek, and knock. And he's going to keep asking until God answers. God is going to answer Habakkuk, and it's not going to be the answer he's expecting. Now, under that, write this. Prayer is something, I'm sorry, Habakkuk prayed for something other than than that answer. He's praying for two things, help and salvation. In this, in this storm that he's in and all that he's seeing, he's saying, God, where are you? He's going to pray for two things. He says, we just read it. How long shall I cry? What is he crying for? We see it in the next verse. I even cry out to you violence and you will not save. What is he asking to be saved from? What is he... If you read that, I want you to go home and wrestle with this a little bit. He's looking at all the bad stuff around and going, God, why aren't you fixing this? God, why is it a little kid at the, at the lake falls in and drowns? God, where were you? God, why is that three-year-old picked up the gun and shot the other one and killed him? God, where were you in that? 
God, why aren't you fixing, why aren't you saving us from what? What is he asking saving from? Say it. Violence. Violence. The southern kingdom has become full of corruptions and contentions and strife. And he's praying for something other than that. He's praying for justice. And church, I want to lay this on your heart. I hope it, I hope it lays on your heart the way it laid on me. God wants to change our life through prayer. I have been more convinced of this in the last two weeks than in my entire life. God wants us to come to him and press into him in prayer now watch this. Let's be honest again, church. How many of you struggle with your prayer life? Be honest. Raise your hand. Look, we struggle because this is so vital and Satan's going to fight everything he can to, to make sure we're not there. I've started a new prayer discipline and I shared it with our men's group this morning and it's, it's scaring me a little bit because God is actually doing some crazy stuff. I'm, my, my wife has Facebook, so I've been stalking y'all. And I go to your pages and I look and I find a picture of y'all and I put it in a folder. And every week I pray for y'all. I look at your picture face to face and I'm praying for y'all. So Linda, I've got like your whole family because you've got some great family shots. So I get all four of you in one picture. And I'm praying for those. Then I say, you know, I need to start praying for my family. So I pulled up some of my family and extended family. I haven't started with L.A. and Jill yet. I haven't gotten that far. But, I, but there was a, a second cousin of mine I haven't seen in years years and I pulled her and her mother up and I'm starting to pray and I was like you know God, I don't even know how to pray for them so you know what I prayed God I don't even know how to pray for them can you help me know what to pray for them the next day I get a text hey this is Deanne your mother gave me your number are you in town Yeah? Can I come by and talk to you? Guess what I found out? What to pray for. So I said, wow, maybe I need to start praying for the people I went to school with. So I'm just, I'm getting excited. So I looked up my friends that I hung out with in school, and I've got them in a folder, and I've been praying for them. Guess who I ran into at the Tappahannock Movie Theater yesterday? Bill Golaski, the guy I used to run around with. We're having dinner Monday. She didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, Mia. We'll have Mia. We'll take. Um, we'll figure it out. What's the odds? It's a God thing. God is trying to teach me that I want you to press into me and be honest in your prayer life, and trust me. Habakkuk is a man of God because he has such a relationship with God. He knows, I can be honest, brutally, frank, honest with God, and he's going to answer me. I felt cheated when I figured out Jeremiah did it and David did it because there was a lot of anger that I had growing up because I had those God why questions, but I was just, now my mother didn't teach me that. It's just something like was pressed into me somehow. You don't do that with God. God doesn't rebuke Habakkuk for being honest. And then he prays for justice. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of help. God wants us to draw close to him. When we begin to pray that it, we take the burdens we have and we put it on God. God, why? And then God comes back and says, this is why. And it helps lift that burden. It helps us to connect with God. It helps us to draw in and draw close. Do you think God hates what Habakkuk is seeing? Is that what he wants for his nation? You know what Habakkuk's experiencing? This is what he's experiencing. God, I know who you are and what things are supposed to be and how things are supposed to be. I know you're good, great, awesome, and sovereign and mercy. And this is your people. That's sometimes how pastors feel. We're supposed to be representing Christ, and you're fighting about that in the Walmart parking lot? Really? Oh, you're throwing a cuss word at the waitress? Really? I thought you were a member of our church. Really? That's what Habakkuk's doing. What we're saying is this. It's not supposed to be this 
but we all have a sin problem, don't we? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but God tells us what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, to hate what God hates. And so we should begin to, to pray. Jeremiah 33, 3 says this, Call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Habakkuk is going to see this next week. He is going to see something that's going to shock him because God's going to reveal it to him. And God's going to reveal it in such a way it's going to cover hundreds of years of history. He wasn't asking for all that, was he? But God's going to show him great and mighty things which he did not know. 1 Peter 4, 7 says this, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in our prayers. 1 Peter 3.12 says this, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to, the, to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. James 5.16, and these are verses we hear, but I want to put it in the context of Habakkuk. James 5.16 talks about, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This book is going to begin with gloom. It's going to end with glory. He's going to finish out the book talking about how great God is. But right now he's struggling. Jesus did that, didn't he? In the Garden of Gethsemane, wasn't he struggling with God? Wasn't he saying, this is a horrible thing that's coming. If you can get me out of it, please get me out of it. Does that mean he was doubting God? They had no faith? Absolutely not. He had total faith. He was being honest with God. And no matter what you're dealing with, you need to be honest with God. He already knows what's in your heart. If I'm angry at God, do you think this is tricking him? Praise God. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. The only person I'm fooling is who? God knows. Wouldn't it be better if I just said, God, I don't know why you let me lose this child. Instead of saying this, ah, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, bless be the name of the Lord. If that's what you're feeling in your heart, say that. But if you're saying, God, why did you take this child? Say that. Say that. And then pray for justice. God, fix this. You ever ask this question? God, why are you not working in this situation? Raise your hand. Let's do a little test. How many have ever said that? God, why are you not working? I don't see you working. God's going to come to Habakkuk and say, I am working, Habakkuk. Where are you? Why have you left us? How many ever felt that way? God's going to say, I haven't left you. Look, look at all that's going on. Why aren't you doing something? I am, Habakkuk. Matter of fact, he says, you won't believe it. And you're not going to get it. That's what he says to Habakkuk. When Jesus was in the garden and he was honest with the Father, in Luke 22 it says this. Jesus prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And in verse 43, we never really talk about this. This is what it says. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Why did Jesus need to be strengthened? You ever thought about that? Why did God send an angel to strengthen Christ? help him. God comes to us and says, I am your help. And oftentimes in our darkest moments, we don't run to God. We run what? Habakkuk is a man of faith because he sees all this going on and he's honest enough with God to go, God, why? And God, I don't know why, but I know what needs to be fixed. And he's honest. Next week, God's going to come and answer him. And we're going to look at that next week. But how does this apply to us today? 
I'm going to let that hang in the air for a second. How does this apply to us? One, I think I shared it with you. You need to be honest with who? That's the best thing you can do today. If you're struggling with something, the best thing you can do today is go to him and be honest. I'm thinking of somebody in particular. I won't say their name because I don't want to embarrass them because I love them so. But you know, they've been wrestling with, I, I want to know God the way that my family knows God. Just be honest with God and say, God, I want to know this. And know that he's going to answer you. Some of us are struggling because we've made some serious mistakes and there's a high price tag on it. Nobody knows yet, but there's a high price tag on it and we're in trouble and we're trying to cover it up. And you know what we need to be? Honest. Because in a relationship, that's what makes things better. We, I talked about Mary Clay um, the other day that she came to be doing Matthew 18. And what it was is it was her roof. She wanted a roof fixed. And I said, well, we'll get on it. We'll get the men's class. I talked to some people, never followed through with it and just kind of let it hang. And she was growing more angry <laughs> with each passing day. And what that will begin to do, you correct me if I'm wrong, Mary Clay, it will begin to poison her with bitterness. And then the relationship begins to deteriorate. And then it's broken. That's why I came to you. And when you came to me, what happened? Maybe the reason you might be having an issue with God is you don't, you're not walking by faith and just being honest with him. So as we leave here today, I want to challenge you in your prayer life, maybe the first time ever, to be honest with God. And say, God, why? Why? And you fill in the blank. Our relationship with God begins with us being honest with God, saying, I'm a sinner, and I need you to forgive me. Please forgive me. He forgives that, doesn't he? Our sanctification begins by saying, God, I want to grow in wisdom and grace, and he answers that, doesn't he? Can God not answer the why? I've been praying for justice for two years about a situation. I am waiting for it to happen because I know God is good. But before I could do that, I had to do God what? Why? Let's go forward in, in prayer this morning. Father, I pray that there's some people have been freed up to be able to be honest with you. Some of the strongest prayers I've ever prayed has been in anger and hurt and disappointment. Father, there's been times I've done everything that you've asked me to do and it still goes south and I don't understand why. And so very often hindsight is 2020. I can see your, your footprints behind me and your hands working in the matters of my life. But in the now, I struggle. I see how things should be or at least what I think they should be. I see what I want. I see way... The things that you, if you would just do it, you would be glorified in a mighty way, and then you don't do it. And I go, God, I, I don't understand. Help us to be honest with you today. Father, some of, some of us need to cry to you and say, God, I want to be saved. And they need to be honest. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I'm trying to see it. God, help me to see it. Some of us need to say, God, I can't forgive them. Help me to forgive. Father, some of us need to say this to you. I don't trust you. We're pretending, but we're not living it. Help us to be honest with you and help us to be ready for the answer. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. If we can sing hymn 705. Did you have one picked out? I'm going to go with you, Lois. Let's do 6.30, and we'll close with M 6.30 this morning. I want to thank you all for praying for us at camp. We had a wonderful camp, and we are following up with all the kids to make sure they understand the gospel and that they are right with the Lord. So I want to ask you all to be in prayer for them. Um, if you want me to pray for you, get my phone number and send me a picture with your name, and I'm going to put you in these folders and pray. Most of you all are already covered, but some of you are visitors I call you regular visitors. 
send me a picture. And Marion, if where's she at? I'm going to get you to come right up here for just a second. Um, she'll give you my number, and we'll be starting our new members class because some of you have asked us about that, and you need to get in touch with her. And the reason we need that is so we can have everything that we need. Is the father and mother to be here? Yes. Come up here. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. <laughs> He's like, yeah, right. <laughs> you can clap. You can clap. Very expected. Uh, they are having a baby shower right over here. And so if you're here, you go love up on them. If you're doing this, I didn't bring a gift. Green goes with everything. <laughs> you can just give them some green. And so we're, do we want them to head over first? Do they get a, a head start? Or do you want to surprise them and have everybody over there first? Oh, no, they can go. I know they have family. Where's the family? I'm going to have the family come up here, too. I won't embarrass you. I promise. <laughs> Hang them out to try. Yeah, they're, they're saying, thanks, Pastor. This will be the last time we come to this church. Also, the deacons will be meeting in the women's Sunday school classroom right after. And we're going to pray for them. And um, we're going to celebrate this little one that's coming into the world and pray for their family. So let's pray for them as we get ready for this celebration. Father, I just want to thank you so much for this couple. Father, I thank you for this gift, this little life that is growing and all the amazement and wonder that comes with it. And we pray that you would just show yourself strong on behalf of this family. Father, I want to thank you for the family that's standing next to them. We pray that you would bless them as well. And just help us as a church to love up on them and to celebrate this, to pray for them. And Father, after this precious one comes into the world, to be there for them, to encourage them and just to help them know uh, all that comes with this precious gift. <laughs> they don't know what they're getting into, just like they didn't know what they were getting into when they got married. But Father, I just pray that you would bless them. We love them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to let you all head on over. Y'all can clap. Y'all have a good day.